This is the Real Estate Power Play Podcast, getting you the information that you need to be a successful real estate investor. Hosted by Mark Monroe, Ronnie Walker, Gabe Rodarte, and me, Marty Grizzani. Combined, we've done thousands of real estate transactions. So get ready for real stories and true case studies on finding deals, growing portfolios, and making money. Welcome to the show. All right, guys, what's going on? Welcome to the Power Play podcast. We are doing a quick live. Wanted to share with the people that were asking us questions on the chat groups and just DMing us, which we get pretty much every day now, which is really awesome. If you guys have any questions, we're happy to help. This is what we're here for. We want to give back to the community. Uh, real estate has transformed my life for sure. Um, and one of the, the niches that we are all good at, Marty, Mark, Ronnie, myself, is just networking, building community, and um, knowing how to uh, really just go into the marketplace that you're in, no matter where you're at, doesn't matter what state you're in, and really just start building out a network to help you build your business. Um, I think one of the things that we hear a lot, and whenever you get started in real estate investing, is you're dropping cash, right? You're dropping money for marketing. You're dropping money for, I don't know, you got a, maybe a coaching program. You're, you know, there's there, you may have your spouse going, what are you doing? Why are you even doing this? What is it worth it? People lose so much money in this stuff, um, all types of stuff. And we talk to those people, we talk to you and we definitely want to help and create value to where you can just help launch your business forward. So Mark, how are you doing? And, uh, let's get cranking on this thing. I really want to go over this topic. I'm excited about it. Yeah. I'm doing great. I can't complain. Um, a little warm. Can't the uh, what are we? August? What are we? August tenth, eleventh? I don't even know how far into the month we are already. Yeah, we're way into yeah, the month. We're halfway into, through the we're month. Halfway through the month. Jerry, is your kids back to school yet? Yes, they're ready. I'm ready. Okay, so let's go over this stuff. So, guys. Um, we are talking about finding off market deals. Now we're not going to go over just yet, um, how to do, uh, the pay-per-click stuff. We're not going to go over any of the direct mail or the, the door knocking stuff yet. We wanted to hammer out creating a referral network that's around you. So one of the best people I know who has created an awesome referral network happens to be Mark Monroe. Um, who does a lot of seller financing, creative financing, has helped me do multiple. I now do creative financing and seller financing and all types of unique stuff. Um, so Mark, how do you, how would you advise a newer person? They get involved. Their spouse is now saying, what in the world are you doing? Right. And you hear multiple podcasts and everything else. And it's your draw, your, your shiny object into spend money, join my group, and you can be a multimillionaire also. What is the first thing that you would do? Um, network. Really get out there and start networking and start building up your referral network. That's really what it comes down to. Like, I, I, I can't remember last time I spent money on marketing to acquire a deal. It's been several years. Um, I just get a, lot, I get a ton of referrals. Um, that's where I get most of my deals from. And we'll get into the type of deal, um, the refer, referral sources. But I would just get out there and network. Um, you know, go to your local chamber counters, believe it or not, go to your local meetup REITs and just start surrounding yourself with peers of like-minded people like yourself. And, you know, it also depends on what level of experience that you're at as well when you're out there networking. Uh, what are your, what are your thoughts on that, Keith? Ironically, I had a friend of mine today, today, uh, he might be listening to this, um, text me this morning i'm on a sales call talking to us uh, uh actually a guy who's through our network is saying he's going to sell he has about 15 doors that he's selling so we're helping him disposition those doors and so we're going through the stuff i'm talking to him on the phone and then a buddy of mine says hey there's a there's a group going on in 30 minutes from now it's right around the corner from where you live i'm going to be over there i don't know what it's about but you want to show up some small business owners and stuff like that i'm like uh i don't know let me see if i have time well, lo and behold, I'm like, it's by a restaurant. I go there. I end up watching the presentation. 
presentation was about AI marketing and how to involve your marketing and technology into you, your referral business and how to do follow-ups. And I'm like, wow. And then lo and behold, here we are talking about it. So it was really cool. So I got to learn that and then I made a connection and then someone else that was there was like, Hey, I run across properties like this. Do you know how to do you, is this what you do? And I'm going, well, explain the property. And it's exactly what we would buy. It's a seller or a homeowner that had it as a rental tenants, destroy the property. They don't want to fix it up. They're going to be upside down if they go and do the rehab. And they're now I'm going to go look at a property tomorrow, all based off of this thing, Mark. And you know, you got to learn how to work a room. You got to learn how to network. But the reality is there's, it's not a bad thing to get outside of your shell and to go, I just need to know where, where does my space, like, how can I create value in this area? And so I get a bunch of birds with one stone. I get to learn some other stuff, get to meet some other people that Mark and I are working on. Mark, you're working on some amazing stuff. Um, but that is just an idea of one source of finding off market deals. It is not something you want to hang your hat on. In my opinion, you need to have something that's more consistent. That's always coming in. And for you to do that, you have to, you have to cast your net pretty wide. So Mark, what is, what is one of the ways that you're doing, like creating a referral network where people know, I mean, this is kind of an odd thing. Hey, I buy distressed properties or I buy this, uh, you know, some like, do you have a probate thing? This kind of sounds kind of weird, right? Or is there a divorce going on that around you? These things sound weird. So how do you create your referral network? It's just getting to just getting to know the person individually and see how, you know, educating them on what my buy box is and how, and, and what's bizarre is actually, I had a conversation today with somebody as well, right in my backyard. And uh, we're talking about, you know, we're seeing a sh little shift. Um, she's starting to get um, some orders for um, broker opinions, you know, BPOs. So obviously if they're getting BPOs, the properties are getting ready to go towards the foreclosure process. So we started talking a little bit and like, you know, she only gets paid like $45 for the BPO. So I'm like, okay, so we're looking at, um, she's got a couple right now um, where she's sending it over to me. We're looking at it and see if we can reach out to the seller and possibly, you know, stop the foreclosure process, if you will. So that's just one example. It's just kind of getting out there and just kind of moving the network and just talking to people, letting them know what you're doing, what you're looking for. Um, that's kind of, it just, it just, gradually over time and just build it up i have probably over 600 referral sources that feed me deals some may get me i may get one a year from one or i could get like last year i had 14 from i closed 14 deals from one referral source so it's so many different type of real you know let's get into it you want to get into like a couple of re, like let's the referral do that. Sources? Let's do that okay um you know look, let's talk about like trashmen you know Think about that one. You know, why, why, would, why do you think a trash man would be good for a referral source that I gave? And that makes total sense. Uh, I don't know if I've ever received a deal from a trash man before, but it makes sense because they're around the neighborhoods every day. Now I have from the next one, probably a mailman, right? Mailman got a one from a mailman before. Yep. And uh, landscapers. I have landscapers snow plow removals um people out in the community contractors um uber drivers amazon drivers i um you know just so i have a system set up like hey you know what if you're out there take a photo of this house you know um send it to us send it to this particular email and then my admin will take it run from there and just do all the skip tracing run the due diligence reach out to the people in the city selling so that is a referral source so that's just another one. I mean, it could go on and on. I mean, just think outside the box of where you could go. Um, normally, I keep this last referral source. Well, not last, but one of my home run referral sources. I usually kind of keep it to myself, but um, hospice nurses. Hospice I got nurses. it. I got, I, it. Yeah. I got it. I got it. Yep. So um, I had one that I just closed not too long ago up in New England. It came from a hospice nurse um it was an elderly couple and you gotta remember they referred it over to me so there's really not a lot of sales going involved they referred it to me uh what happened was it was an elderly couple 
Um, he's uh, ill. He's been in hospice for a little while. And then um, she's elderly, so she can't take care of him that night anymore. So they had to move in with a daughter, and the daughter lived about three hours away. They reach out to me and see what I could do to help them. They've owned the home for 35, 38 years, something like that. So it was just too much for them to get the house ready to put on the market. You know, when you, um, you know, just so much. So I said, just take what you want, whatever you don't want, just leave behind. I mean, they left cable boxes, TV modems, holiday de decorations, dishes. They left everything there. And I ended up uh, getting that one on the seller financing. Um, and with two months with no payments on it, because it's taking me some time to get that payment that property ready and now i'm just wrapping it because they had no mortgage on the property so i just did trade seller financing with a seven-year balloon and what we did is we put the mortgage into a trust so if anything happens to her it automatically goes to the heirs of the children so that's a form of a seller that's that's i get a lot of really good deals through hospice nurses i also wow. yeah, really go, ahead. Cool. Jump in. go ahead no that's really cool i think that um we do um and i say this a lot but uh, probate. And so, I mean, I, I think we just have a, a, there's just a lot of assets. A lot of the net worth type assets I have are probate derived assets. Uh, they came from the probate world where, for instance, if it was a tire landlord or something like that, not so much. Those homes are normally tore to crap where there's so much up work or um, up um, lift on it that uh, it kind of throws the numbers off a little bit, but the probate stuff, you know, you got to think that someone who is, um, you know, getting a house deeded over to them because it was their moms or their grandmas or something, those homes tend to be in better shape over time because they just, there's not kids running through the house all crazy or something like that, or there's not tenants that are destroying the home. They're there by themselves and they're taking care of the house. Right. And so those are, those are a little bit easier to do. And I tend to, most of our portfolio has come from a probate, a single family at least, come from probate situations. And even some multifamily like the, um, we have some, like some tiny home park stuff and some stuff like that. That's, they just couldn't maintain and keep up with the mobile home park because it's a lot of work, right? So that's an idea. No, I, I like that. Um, you know, I, one came across my desk that it was the same thing, mobile home park, went through probate, the kids took it over and fell behind in property taxes they haven't paid property taxes on in five years and now uh we looked at purchasing it and uh we just didn't it just needed too much work the city now is taking it over and the city is actually managing the mobile home park <laughs> do you believe that one <laughs> so we may still uh do something and have the city kind of give us some money uh to kind of get it all cleaned up and we're looking at possibly subdividing them into regular lots and then turn around and put double wides in because it is going to take uh, quite a bit to kind of get that ready. So, wow, that's cool. Okay. So how would someone going to go through um, looking for leads and we see stuff on Facebook. Uh, I think Facebook's a really good place for single family to, to live, even though there's a lot of other things you have TikTok. you Mark, you do TikTok, right? Don't you, don't you do marketing through TikTok? Uh, I do. I do. I do some stuff. I, I haven't gotten a lot of deals through there. I get more through Facebook, um, but um, I am starting to get some stuff there. Um, okay. And believe it or not, I have gotten some deals through LinkedIn as well. Yeah. So there's LinkedIn. I think uh, what is uh, what is something that's different that you have to do on LinkedIn than you do on Facebook? You just want to be out there promoting yourself so people see that you're actually doing some business. Um, and then doing that, then you'll start getting some referrals coming to you. That's really what it is. And then besides, you know, finding off market deals, then you tend to get some capital private uh, money as well, because they see you're out there doing deals. They don't have the time and energy. They have the capital and they want to deploy it into some assets. So they get a good return instead of just having it all in the stock market. Look at like, again, look at what happened today in the market. So they want to kind of de you know, deploy the capital everywhere. Man, that's genius. Uh, I'll be honest. I don't think that a lot of people really see the benefit of LinkedIn. Uh, now in the commercial space, totally in the business world, totally. Um, cause people go there to go and find out. So there's some cool things you could do on LinkedIn. Also, if you're out there networking, if you have a great net LinkedIn profile, there's an easy QR code that they already have in there 
that you could just click the QR code button and you can meet people and then they connect with you through LinkedIn. Um, so when you go to certain networking groups or when you go to certain uh, connection stuff, especially within commercial groups and brokers, everybody has a LinkedIn profile, right? Where if you do more of a single family, I mean, or residentials type stuff, yeah, single family, you're not going to see so much of that. You'll see more Facebook driven type stuff. And that's in my experience. I'm in the Houston Metro market. Uh, we do some other markets outside of Texas, but that's pretty much what I've been seeing the most. Um, cool. All right. So what else do no. we have, Mark? Well, actually, wholesalers, believe it or not, are actually a great source as well you know, buying deals from wholesalers. You just gotta be selective, you know, there's some great wholesalers and then there's wholesalers that are just being super greedy where the numbers just don't make any sense. But if you find the right ones and really good ones, I have some that are so realistic doing some high volume that they're so realistic in their uh, wholesale or assignment fee where it makes sense. So it has to be a win from everybody. You know, when you're buying a property from a seller, has to be a win for them and if you're selling it to a buyer it has to be a win for them so even no matter where your source is you're getting your referral source from if it's a wholesaler or whoever it is it has to make sense so everybody it's a win for everybody instead of just being one-sided got it yeah that works and so that's actually one of the key ways if you're looking at finding properties where you can find them off market is to do through wholesalers now one of the things how do you find wholesalers right same way. So you're going to go to the Facebook groups like we're doing right now. You're going to go to your communities. Um, there's actually a group in a, a different state that we're looking at. And I was like, I was talking to my wife. I was like, what do you want to do? And uh, she asked me a couple questions like immediately go to that city and look up the real estate groups that are local in that city. Um, actually, that deal that I was talking about today, some guy went from outside the Houston metro area and found me through social media, through Facebook somehow, um, through a different group, not even my groups, not even this power play group. I guess I made a comment somewhere and he goes, hey, um, you seem like a likable person. I need some help with my portfolio. I just need to offload it. I had a stroke or I had a, his wife had a stroke. Um, so those type of things. So, okay, wholesalers. Now um, to add into what Mark is saying, what you want to do is vet the wholesaler and how do you do that, right? So I guess that's a really good question to ask. Like, how do you vet a wholesaler? Well, look at their page, look at their company name. You can take their company name, plug it into Facebook and see how credible they are. Um, I got some really good friends here that have, uh, they've been around for 10 years in a wholesale group. I would trust any deal that they send me. Um, if I buy it from them, I know I get, I'm going to get real information. I'm going to, because the thing that I think people get concerned about is the non refundable earnest money, right? They're going to drop three to $5,000 on a property to make sure that you're actual real buyer. You're not just tying up to lose, lose time. That's really what they're doing. So how do you want to present yourself to a wholesaler, Mark? um if, how do i want to present my yeah they, they can come to me and i'll help them with the earnest money deposit if, if they don't have it that's kind of one of the examples that i tend to do i said hey you know what this is my buyer box this is what i'm looking for if you don't have that capital to put down um for whatever reason reach out to me and i'll put the capital down for the earnest money deposit and we can kind of work the deal that way as well I, hopefully that's what you're looking for yeah so so you're saying you do that with um with other investors or who do you do that with I do that with wholesalers too. Like if they're like, say it's somebody new that wants to get into wholesaling and I will say, Hey, why don't you start out with the wholesaling is less capital. And if you don't have that money for the capital for the earnest money deposit, reach out to me, we'll look at it and we'll, you know, whatever you whatever it is, I'll pay you whatever the amount is. It has to be within reason, um, whether that be greedy, but I've actually done that before on several. Uh, exactly. new people on the wholesaling. So I just give my buy box if that makes sense. Yeah. So you give, so, so Here's the other side of this. And for those who are looking for finding off market deals, you can give your buy box to a group of people, wholesalers or newer folks, newbies, and say, look, this is the stuff we're looking for. We can JV. I'll be happy to pay you a referral fee or I'll pay you part of the deal. Um, and we'll go through there, but it'll be my capital up front. So normally you tend to get a the higher cut of the deal uh, or a bigger cut of the deal, I guess you could say. 
Uh, but yes, we do do that. And it's actually a common thing to be doing nowadays. It's not uncommon where there was a season where that was looked down upon. I don't know why it makes total sense to me because we do it. Um, but no, so, so here's another question was if someone is looking to be a credible buyer to a wholesaler, what are some of the things that that credible buyer to find those off market deals to a wholesaler? What do they need to have? Yeah, for the buyer, I agree with you on that one uh, because there's a lot of buyers out there that are they're saying they're buyers, but they're not. You know, we come across that all the time. You know, making sure that they have a deposit, you know, earnest money deposit. That's one way. Um, checking them out as well, looking up their company name, looking them up. I go to LinkedIn. I do Google. Um, I look at the state secretary. How long have they been in business? Um, and just look at their social networking and see who they're related to. Most likely. Uh, when I say related to meaning their colleagues and who they're, if they have a, other, a lot of other investors within their network. So the really good buyers, majority of them um, are in the network. They have a lot of people. They're always constantly working with other people because, you know, like today I had a deal that came in. Um, it really wasn't in my buy box, but it was a sweet deal. And I referred that over to uh, somebody else that I know because I knew it was a good deal. But uh, I just didn't want it. It wasn't. In, it was in Wisconsin. I just don't have good boots on the ground in that area. Um, but that deal is going to cash flow about eight, nine hundred dollars a month, and it's only a ten thousand dollar entry fee to get in that deal. You know, and it's a duplex, so it's a great deal. That so, sounds like um, a great deal. It is. I, it was almost. It was almost too good to give up, but I just had too much going on to kind of go down that path at that time. Totally. So I'm just like, hey, here's a good deal. Once you run with it, you know that type of thing. Let's go over that real quick. And I think that people think that um, I used to think this in the beginning is like when someone because I didn't have any deals at the time. <laughs> so uh, it just baffled me how someone goes, listen, I got a lot of stuff going on right now. I don't have the time to take this on. It does this fit you. And I just and someone told me this and they probably was in front of a stage kind of like this. And, and I'm going, that's just baffled me. Like, why would you why would you not have enough? or have too much going on. And it is true that you can get to a place where your business is growing, you're doing really well, or you have your buy box and it's just on the outside of it. And you know, you might be able to capitalize on it, but it's enough outside your buy box that, that it's gonna take a little bit more effort than what you have right now, right? Where if you didn't have anything going on right now, you would probably tackle it. But now, and I think that happens as your business grows throughout different cycles, there's different stuff, there's certain areas of town that you're just like, I don't need to go over there anymore. I'm actually really busy in my area. Um, and people do that as you grow, you figure out your niche. Um, so how can someone capitalize or, or, or look at that? What is some phrase, Mark, that they need to be asking other investors to find off market deals? Well, I want to back up to that. What we're just talking about that, you know, when you have deals come in and you think it's still a good deal, and it's really outside your buy box or outside your room. You know, I've seen so many people, like investors that, you know, they know what their buy box is, but they end up going down that path. And they end up spending so much time and energy on a deal that, you know, like this example that I talked about. And they end up, the, the time and the energy they put in that one deal, they could do three or four or five deals. So have, I'm sure you've seen that as well. I was saying, I, I have done that actually. I've been that guy, you know? And so, and I was actually just doing a conference call with someone that was asking for some marketing advice and, you know, you guys DM me, I, I got, I got tons of ideas that can help you build your business. Um, and one of the things was, and this was for commercial, I'm like, you have to narrow down your buy box to where you can say no faster because you have a hundred leads coming in. And what happens is you can get overwhelmed thinking I got to go through all these hundred leads and you go, just name three things that, that pass your, your sniff test, just three things. Does it fit the area, right? If it's single family, does it fit the area and structural what you're looking for? Right? So really simple. Are you only looking for slab? Great. Well, this is on peers. So just say no to everything that's not on peers, right? Or if it's, I, I don't know how to do mobile homes. Okay, well, stop looking at the mobile homes. Like maybe there's something here. If it's something that you don't want to do, don't put it in your list in the beginning, right? Until you feel confident doing it. So you take a couple things off your sniff test and then now you got rid of 50 properties, 
right? And then you go to your second tier. Out of those 50 properties, does it fit whatever else, you know, maybe the rehab or maybe, you know, anything else that really needs to fit your markers uh, of what you're looking for. If you're looking for rentals or looking for cash, like flipping or, or hoteling type deal, um, throw those in there. Or maybe it just doesn't fit any of those and you're looking for sub two type deals. Well, that's really easy to do, right? To go through your, your properties, Mark, Am I not, am I not wrong where you're going, okay, which one of these can I do seller financing sub two deals? Can I do some type of creative structure? I mean, that goes from a hundred down to seven really fast. Absolutely. And then you're not going to waste your time and energy on deals. That's not going to get, make you any money. I mean, it will make you money. You just got to look at where your time and energy, where you, you can get the best results. You, you know, again, like I said earlier, you definitely go make some money in that deal. But the time and energy in that deal, where if you stay into your buy box, you can do three, five deals in that same amount of time as that one. I've, we all been there. I've yeah. been there. I can admit it. I've been there as well. It's like, oh, this looks like a great one. I'd like to learn this one. I'm like, you know, if you're at a if you're at a place and you want to learn that other asset, if you will, um, that's outside your buy box, just be plan on just spending a lot of time and energy in your other buy box business is going to sit on the side and suffer a little bit unless you have some other team members and partners that can kind of help you carry that. So that goes into something that I want to talk about with finding off market deal off market deal is learning how to track. And I think most people don't know this. Um, so here's something pretty simple. If you're just getting started, there's a thing called Google Forms. So you go to Google, and in the top right corner, you scroll down a little bit and there's a forms button. Um, and in that Google form, you can create anything in the world for you of what you want to track. Uh, we used to use this in the very beginning of our networking group. We would just have people click in the Google forms and you can have it set up to where whatever you like, how many calls you made today? How many seller calls did you make? How many direct to seller, how many broker calls, how many realtor calls, you can have it all set up and don't overwhelm yourself. Um, you can also do how many offers did you send out, right? How many uh, contracts did you get that day? And then you can, you can look at the report and at the end of a week, you'll see if you're really honored your time. If you're saying, if you're doing what you're saying you're doing, right? And then at the end of two weeks, You'll have a full blown, I know where my time's going. I know what I'm tracking. I know what I'm calling on. And then you can go to someone like me or like Mark and go, look, this is my spreadsheet. This is what I'm doing. Can you tweak this for me? And when someone does something like that, that's just music to my ears going, wow, you've done the work and you care enough. Let me help you go through it. And this is one of the highlights of like, when I talk with people, I like to talk about what they have tracked because you can tell who's putting in the work, but then you go, you know what? You have such a good return talking to wholesalers. Like for whatever reason, you're better at it than the rest of the people that I've seen. I think you really need to hammer this place out a little bit more because I'm seeing you're getting really good traction here. Or you're getting really good at your PPC. You know, or you're getting really good on your online marketing or your direct mail or these other things. And the tracking side, guys, in the very beginning, I used to not think it was that big of a deal. I was just in the in the, the beginning, I was just dropping money on mailers and postcards, and that was it. And then I would track the inbound, right? Overall, how much I sent out and the inbound, but not really the dollar amount. But guys, this is so key because for me now, I know what's the best time for me to call my brokers and my sellers, what's the best time to do outbound sales, what's the best time to do calls. And I know, and some days I know I'm going to miss it. Let's say if it's best for me to make my calls within a certain type of uh, marketing I do, let's say the best time is like at 10 o'clock. Okay. And then one, I have a busy day. My 10 o'clock's already booked. It's not that I don't make my calls. I just know what my returns normally are if I start making them after 2 p.m. It's just how it goes. But this is so key. And I think this helps with that 80, 20% that 80, 20 rule of going like, what's the 20% that's going to give you the 80% return. If you don't know how to do this, I think it's going to hurt you on to hurt you later on. 
one of the things that's helped me the most, Mark, and you've helped me with this of going, allow this to create history so you can create your W's for later on down the road, right? And I know that you're good at tracking W's because you tell me <laughs> like, hey, I got to win here. I got to win there. So and then and then we can close out with that because I know this is really important and we both got to hop off and value other people's time. Why is this so important with when you're when you're finding these art market deals? Because it kind of looks like you're just sh shiny object syndrome all over the place. But, you know, your business really well. Why is this so important? I just know my my systems and you have to have good systems in place. And, you know, I want to back up. You said something there a little while ago. You know, if you're if you're kind of new in real estate and you kind of lost and you're not on the phone making calls and kind of building a network up and your referrals up every day, just make five phone calls to somebody new and just pick up the phone. If it's through social media, I, I'd highly recommend using social media and, you know, and, you know, send somebody a, create a calendar link account and say, hey, here's my calendar. Let's jump on a call. Select the time that works for you. And then what happens is they're booking calls for you. So it's forcing you to be able to, to be on the phone and talking to people. So if you have that, if you feel like you're in that situation where you're not making enough calls and because you're not in, in oh boy, I got to sit down today. And I got to make calls. Who am I going to make? Blah, blah, blah. Well, go into social media, just start networking. Here's my calendar. Select the time that works best for you and then set up your calendar link. And then you're going to have five, 10 phone calls a day on your calendar. So you're going to be busy. And what will happen is you'll get too busy. So you have to start blocking times off. But that's a great way to start it. But I just wanted to throw that out there. Game on. That's awesome. Guys, we're going to wrap it up. Hopefully this is a good one for you guys to just really put into action right away. We want to keep things to where it's practical and you could just put it to work. We want to see you successful. Contact us if you if you have questions for something else for us to hammer out. We'd be happy to do it uh, even a different day of the week just to do a 30 minute us brainstorming and how we can help someone build their business. So guys, we'll talk to you later. Peace. This has been another episode of Real Estate Power Play guiding real estate entrepreneurs to a brighter future. If you liked what you heard, consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast or follow us on YouTube at Real Estate Power Play.